Now, the reason that I'm giving Vietnam its own section of the lecture is because you probably know that the United States will be involved in a, an undeclared war in Vietnam, just similar to the undeclared war in Korea. But I want to give a little bit of context to the story, especially how the United States did eventually get involved in Vietnam. And to give this context, I'm going to go back to 1919 at the Paris Peace Conference to negotiate a peace at the end of the Great War. Hopefully you remember that. President Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, which included the creation of multiple independent nations based on the idea of nationalism and which called for a League of Nations that would guarantee independence and territorial integrity to both large and small nations, seemed to be a declaration that colonial people should be given equal weight on the world stage. Well, there at the conference, a former chef, Nguyen Ai Quoc, and a small group of Vietnamese nationalists turned up to petition the assembled powers to liberalize the French regime in Indochina. The two controlling powers in the conference, the United States and France, ignored Nguyen and his petition. It's not even clear that Wilson actually received the petition to even respond to it. Although Wilson's own white supremacy would have probably resulted in a negative response anyway. As Wilson saw it, nationalism was something for European nations, Asian and African countries were the rightful property of those conquering nations. After the Paris Peace Conference, Nguyen Ai Quoc became a founding member of the Chinese Communist Party. In a few years, he began a return trip back to Asia, stopping in the USSR where he studied communist revolutionary tactics. In 1924, he went to China to organize exiled Vietnamese communists, but was expelled in 1927. He traveled until returning to Vietnam in 1941, where he became a leader in the Vietnamese independence movement. At some point in his journey, Nguyen Ai Quoc changed his name to the one you might know him by, Ho Chi Minh. Like Indonesia and Thailand, Vietnam had been invaded and occupied by Japan during World War II, and they encouraged the Vietnamese to strike out against the French. Ho Chi Minh formed a guerrilla army that successfully attacked both the French and the Japanese. Their main targets, though, were the French, who had treated the Vietnamese very severely. For example, Va Win Zap, the leader of Ho Chi Minh's guerrilla force called the Viet Minh, turned to anti-French communism early when the French beat his wife to death in prison. Ho Chi Minh's guerrilla force, the Viet Minh, led by General Va Win Zap, made their biggest strike against the French in the August Uprising on August 14, 1945. Within weeks, Ho's forces controlled most rural villages and cities throughout Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh called for the Vietnamese to rise up before the Free French could re-establish control in the wake of the Japanese surrender. On September 2, 1945, while European eyes were trained on the USS Missouri, where the surrender of Japan was taking place, hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese people streamed to Hanoi to see Ho Chi Minh in person. In Ba Den Square, Ho Chi Minh proclaimed Vietnamese independence. He began his declaration with words that might sound familiar. All men are created equal, with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Men used Thomas Jefferson's words because he hoped for American support. Now, Franklin Roosevelt had promised the post-war world would respect the rights of all people to choose the government under which they lived. President Truman inherited a different world than FDR's projection. With Soviets occupying Eastern European countries they had overrun and hoping to spread influence to Turkey, Iran, and the Mediterranean, the United States reconsidered supporting Vietnamese independence. French President Charles de Gaulle warned that if the U.S. insisted on independence for her colonies, then France might fall under Soviet influence, and I already mentioned in the Cold War lecture that there was a sizable Communist Party in France. In the grand scheme of things, keeping France afloat was of greater interest to the United States than whether or not Vietnam was independent or a colony. For the time being, the best hopes from the U.S. side were that the French and Ho Chi Minh could work things out peacefully. President Truman kept the United States neutral in this regard, but kept a seven-man OSS, that's the Office of Strategic Services, that's the forerunner to the CIA, kept this seven-man OSS team that had been part of the Asian war effort in Saigon to gather intelligence on the independence movement. As in other Japanese-occupied countries, Allied leaders agreed to temporarily divide Vietnam into two zones. Nationalist Chinese troops would handle the north, British colonial troops would try the same thing in the south, where rival factions of French and Viet Minh were already fighting on the streets of Saigon. No one seemed to be in charge. There was brutality, atrocity, and violence on both sides. It was not quite a civil war, but it was close to it. Lieutenant Colonel Peter Dewey, commander of the OSS team sent by the United States, worked with both the French and various Vietnamese nationalist groups. The Viet Minh were the most successful, and Dewey was able to broker talks between the French and representatives of the Viet Minh. 
This infuriated the British general, ostensibly in charge in South Vietnam, who insisted that French control should be reinstated. Dewey was not impressed by anything the European powers were doing, though. He sent a telegraph that encapsulated what was going on back to America. He said, quote, Vietnam is burning, French and the British are being destroyed there, and we are forced to get out of Southeast Asia. Dewey was on his way to the airport two days later when he was stopped at a roadblock and ambushed. Viet Minh forces mistook him for a Frenchman, since he spoke French, and killed him. Dewey was probably the greatest American friend that Ho Chi Minh had, and now he was dead because of a case of mistaken identity. Ho Chi Minh sent a letter of condolence to the United States, but the damage was done. And on a side note, his body was never recovered by the United States. A week later, French troops retook control of the city of Saigon with the intention to occupy and take back the entire country. Ho Chi Minh still hoped to achieve independence without a war and hoped the United States would intervene. He told an American journalist, You have never had an empire. You never exploited the Asian peoples. Don't be blinded by this issue of communism. He did not want to fight the French as an enemy of the United States. He wrote to President Truman, Look, hey, we believe in the same things. On February 28, 1946, Ho Chi Minh sent a telegram to Truman, begging for Truman and the American people to intervene in support of the independence movement, quote, in keeping with the principles of the Atlantic and San Francisco charters, end quote. The Atlantic Charter was an agreement between the U.S. and Britain in 1941, and the San Francisco Charter is what, in essence, created the United Nations in 1945. In both of these documents, there's support for self-government and independence. President Truman never responded, in part because a telegram was never given to him. In June 1946, Ho Chi Minh went to Paris in a fruitless attempt to get the French to live up to a promise they had made of increased autonomy to Vietnam. While Ho was away, General Zop began to consolidate communist control of the revolution. He purged leaders of rival nationalist parties and people he called reactionary saboteurs, landlords, moneylenders, Trotskyites, Catholics, people accused of collaborating with the French. Hundreds were shot, drowned, or buried alive. On December 19, 1946, after months of building tension, fighting broke out in Hanoi between the Viet Minh and the French. The Viet Minh proved no match for the French firepower. Ho, Zap, and their comrades slipped out of the city and retreated to the north. France poured thousands of men into Vietnam. French regulars, European mercenaries, and colonial troops from Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Senegal fought alongside an army of Laotians, Cambodians, and anti-communist Vietnamese. The French-led forces managed to occupy most of the large towns and province capitals and established hundreds of isolated outposts. The French also tried to win over rural Vietnamese populations through what they called pacification. They built dikes for irrigation, schools, roads, they vaccinated children. But at night, the Viet Minh came back. The French were never really secure in their control. The Viet Minh blew up bridges, mined roads, ambushed French patrols, and then disappeared. French soldiers sometimes took revenge on the next village, raping women, executing men they believed to be Viet Minh soldiers, burning homes, killing livestock. The communists were just as ruthless as the French. They specifically targeted anyone who had links to the French. In many ways, the ordinary Vietnamese person lived under two oppressors, the French and the Viet Minh. In 1949, remember 1949, the year that containment didn't seem to be working? President Truman authorized $23 million in aid to France to keep Vietnam in French control, ostensibly to contain the spread of communism. After Mao took over, China and communist insurrections were underway in Burma and Myanmar, again, former British colonies. Mao and Stalin both promised aid to Ho Chi Minh's communist forces. Thus, the United States was no longer neutral because it did not appear that this war was about independence as it was about stopping Vietnam from becoming a communist country. And while the conflict in Korea distracted the United States, China, and to a lesser extent the Soviet Union, by 1953 the French had been fighting in Vietnam for seven years. They had suffered more than 100,000 casualties and gone through seven different military commanders. In the fall of 1953, the French agreed to talks to end the fighting, to which Ho Chi Minh agreed to meet. Now remember, 1953 is when the French gave up control over Laos and Cambodia. But before negotiators met in Geneva, Switzerland, each side sought to improve its position on the battlefield. The French set up a fortified base in a remote valley in northeast Vietnam called Dien Bien Phu, where the French hoped to lure the Viet Minh into a decisive battle. The French knew that their superior air and firepower could crush the Viet Minh. They dug their base into the valley floor, seemingly unconcerned about the hills around them. Now, 
I'm not a military historian. I don't know much about military strategy, but I do know that in general, you want to have the high ground. 11,000 French soldiers were basically sitting ducks. General Zopp saw a chance to strike. He said, quote, We decided to wipe out, at all costs, the whole enemy force at Dien Bien Phu. To do it, he pulled off one of the greatest logistical feats in military history. Nearly 250,000 people, almost half of the women, moved everything he needed for a siege on foot through the jungle up the mountains. Zap surrounded the valley with 200,000 soldiers and guns camouflaged so well that they couldn't be spotted from the air. On March 13, 1954, Viet Minh artillery on the hillsides began to rain down 50 shells per minute on the French troops below. The French airstrip was destroyed, and the only way that troops could be reinforced down there was through airdrop. The French artillery commander, who had previously bragged that he had more guns than he needed, committed suicide. Fighting continued for over six weeks. The French asked President Eisenhower to intervene, but Eisenhower refused to act without Congress, and Congress refused to go in unilaterally without a European ally. Great Britain refused, so the U.S. was out. Privately, Eisenhower believed, quote, that no military victory is possible in this theater, end quote. However, Eisenhower sent, via contractors, civilians using government planes that had their, like, USA logos marked out, to send supplies to the desperate French troops. But it was not enough. On the afternoon of May 7th, 1954, after 55 days of siege, the exhausted French forces surrendered. They had lost 8,000 men, killed, wounded, or missing. General Zopp had lost three times as many men, but won a great victory. The next afternoon in Geneva, diplomats gathered to settle the future of Vietnam. Talks dragged on for two and a half months. Despite the huge victory at Dien Bien Phu, Zapp and Ho Chi Minh could not keep fighting without help from China and the Soviets. China lost a million men in Korea and did not want to become involved in another war on its borders. The Soviet Union, now under the leadership of Nikita Khrushchev, hoped to ease tensions with the West. Both of Ho Chi Minh's communist patrons urged him to agree to a settlement, similar to what ended the Korean War. In the end, no one was satisfied. Vietnam was to be temporarily divided at the 17th parallel, the 130,000 French-led troops in the north were to retreat to the south, and the 50 to 70,000 Viet Minh troops were to regroup in the north. The two halves would be separated by a demilitarized zone until an election could be held to unify the country. And everyone knew that if the election were held then, that Ho Chi Minh would win single-handedly. Under the Geneva Accords, civilians living in either half of Vietnam who wanted to relocate to the other side of the country would have 300 days to do so. In the end, some 900,000 refugees, including more than half the Catholics in the country, fled to the South, many on American ships. The U.S. hoped somehow to encourage the building of a legitimate government in the South to counter Ho Chi Minh in the North. The South Vietnamese government was created by Ngo Dinh Diem, a Roman Catholic Confucian who had once planned to become a priest. President Diem said he wanted to turn South Vietnam into a democracy. Like Ho Chi Minh, Diem had spent years abroad seeking support for his own brand of Vietnamese nationalism. He was a veteran politician whose loathing for the French was matched only by his hatred for the communists, who had imprisoned him and buried alive his eldest brother and his nephew. Diem was aloof, autocratic, mistrustful of anyone beyond his own family. He also proved resourceful, shrewd, and skilled at exploiting the weaknesses of his opponents. But he faced a daunting task in creating a country. The French, who still had thousands of troops stationed in the South, detested him. Now, the French actually supported a crime syndicate, like a mafia, that ruled Saigon because they didn't want Ziem to succeed. The U.S. had decided basically to end support for Ziem's regime, but then Ziem made an all-out assault on the crime syndicate and won. Eisenhower saw no option but to stick with him. The French then announced they were getting out of South Vietnam altogether, ending nearly a century of occupation. Aziem called for a referendum in the South. When the results were in, he claimed to have earned 98% of the votes. He named himself the first president of the brand new Republic of Vietnam. And that election to reunify the North and South never happened. There's a lot more to the story. I'm sure you know that. American intervention and provocation will eventually lead to the Vietnam War, another undeclared war. That was a war. And it was one that shook the United States to its core. By the end, more than 58,000 Americans and hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese people died before the U.S. got out in 1975. Instead of seeing what was going on in Vietnam as an independence movement, though, the United States saw it as a crucial domino in what Eisenhower called the domino effect, or you might have heard it called the domino theory. One domino falls to communism, others fall after it. In and of itself, Vietnam didn't seem to mean much to the United States unless it turned to communism. 
Vietnam seemed to mean a heck of a lot to the French. I'd like to know why the French were so adamant about hanging on to it. But when we pick up with African decolonization, we'll see that's kind of a thing for them. But more on that later. In the next section of the lecture, we're going to take a look at what some of the effects of all this decolonization in Asia led to.